Okay, um, so without uh, further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you to, to today's speaker next. Um, just, just bear in mind as well, we'd love to hear your questions and, and get a, really get a discussion going after the talk as well. So, so during the talk, um, please add any questions you have to the Q&A panel um, of the Hopin platform. So our speaker today is a partner at Nuri Consulting. Um, his book, Specification by Example, won the Jolt Award for the best book of 2012, and his blog won the UK Agile Award for the best online publication in 2010. Um, he's helped companies around the world improve their software delivery from some of the largest financial institutions to small, innovative startups. He specializes in agile and lean quality improvement, in particular, impact mapping. Um, Specification by example and behavior driven development. So, ladies and gentlemen, delighted to introduce Goiko Adzic. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. And uh, it's lovely to have a global audience. Uh, these remote meetups ended up a wonderful opportunity to uh, talk to people I never get to talk to usually. And um, as David said, I, I kind of, uh, one of my passions is getting um, great products out through the door. And um, my journey with impact mapping started um, when I was a CTO of a, a startup in 2008, 2009. And we were incredibly, incredibly well um, churning out software. We had all the technical practices that people can dream about. We had continuous delivery before the book came out. We had um, full test automation. We were deployed in the cloud, all the buzzwords, absolutely all the buzzwords, everything that the cool kids were doing. And um, we were very, very efficient getting software out of the door, but we were really bad at figuring out is what we're doing delivering any value. And the company ran out of money. And as a, as a CTO, this was a big wake-up call for me because I realized I have to kind of prevent this from ever happening again in my life. So I started doing lots of research to figure out how are other people solving these problems. And um, that's how I stumbled upon impact mapping. Impact mapping is a, a facilitation, conversation, visualization technique that can really help gel together lots of great today's product management practices. And that's why I love it. It's, it's kind of the glue that brings everything together in a very nice way. And that can bring uh, developers, product people, stakeholders together to really understand the big picture and to understand where they want to go and, and what they want to do. So um, the slides for today are already up on my blog, goiko.net slash s slash prod L, product elevation 21 PDF. And you can download it from there. I will be mentioning lots of books and you'll find all the references in the slides. Uh, so you can, you can get that. And as David said, I, I used to do a lot of uh, consulting work. Um, last couple of years, I've actually been focusing on building my own products. And um, there's a kind of very quick plug of what I'm doing now, if anybody's interested. Um, currently, I'm building this um, tool that helps people create narrated videos very, very quickly. So you can just type up uh, whatever you want uh, the audio to say into the speaker notes of a PowerPoint document, upload the PowerPoint document, click a button, and you'll get a wonderful narrated video. We use amazingly good text-to-speech voices. So if anybody's kind of creating quick marketing or promotional videos or explainers, check this out. Uh, you can find it on eraki.com. And that's kind of where I've been actually applying a lot of impact mapping uh, in, in practice recently. And um, to kind of put this a bit into, into the context, um, lots and lots of software companies end up delivering stuff like we did that actually very rarely provides any value. And there was a famous case uh, publicly written about um, in 2016 uh, in England where the BBC, the, the kind of public broadcaster, spent 75 million pounds on a project and they shut it down because it delivered no value. And um, because BBC is a government, it's, it's a publicly funded corporation, not a government funded, but publicly funded, um, 
the National Audit Office of the United Kingdom got involved to try to figure out how can you possibly spend 75 million pounds on a software project and not deliver any value. And not just that, but not spot that you're not delivering any value until you've spent so much money. And the conclusion was absolutely brilliant. You can find the conclusion on this link. It's in the PDF. Um, and uh, they said that they were able to spend so much money because the project was agile. And what that meant is what, whatever was delivered each month, the managers could just kind of make up the benefits. And um, the same people asking for features were also the judges of whether those features are delivering value or not. And basically, they were always happy that the features were delivered. And they were just making up the benefits to justify the feature list. And this is horribly bad. Um, as a publicly funded corporation that can never run out of money, yes, you can do this. You get into the news, but it's not a big problem. As a small software organization, if you do something like this, like we did, game over. And that's kind of what I wanted to prevent myself from ever doing again. So I started researching and said how people solve these problems. And I stumbled upon impact mapping. Impact mapping is a visualization technique that was developed by a Swedish interaction design agency called InUse. And they've originally developed it to prevent the Swedish government from running stupid IT projects into the ground and being able to visualize where this thing is going. And um, I've kind of noticed that it could be really helpful for the stuff I'm doing, and I've used it on a couple of projects. And then I've realized, look, you know, somebody should really like write a good book about this and, and make, it, make more people know about it. So kind of that, that's where I come in. Um, uh, some people, you know, now associate me with that, and they think I created it. I didn't. I just wrote a popular book about it. All the credits actually go to Inus and, and Ingrid Dominguez. So um, how do we stop this from happening? That's kind of the, the key thing. How do we understand before spending so much money that what we're doing is or isn't going in the right direction? And one big thing that kind of we need to first understand is the same people who ask for features cannot be kind of the judges of whether those features work or not. And in a sense, um, Don Reinertsen, uh, in his book, The Principles of Product Development Flow, already described this very well. Uh, he said that it's very popular to say that um, a customer who's informed about something is the kind of primary judge of whether we're adding value or not. But that's actually dangerous because the, the big danger there is that we end up judging that we're delivering a solution rather than solving a problem. And those two are totally different things. Um, there's a wonderful paper from the FBI called Why FBI Cannot Deliver a Case Management System by Jerome Israel, where they write about this thing, where FBI tried to do three subsequent rewrites of their case management system, every time measuring basically function points and story points and things like that as measurements of value. And um, the, the big conclusion at the end was that all of that was actually just measuring whether they're delivering something, not whether that was the right thing to do. And um, that's kind of a big problem because in lots and lots of software projects, we end up measuring stuff that's directly proportional to effort instead of proportional to value. And um, there's another wonderful book that um, I, I strongly recommend everybody reads if you've not read it. It's called Four Disciplines of Execution by Stephen Covey. And in the book, he presents research from thousands of organizations where they've tried to compare what do people who are incredibly good at executing, who are incredibly good at driving their projects towards success, do differently from people that just waste a lot of money and time. And if you've kind of um, applying modern software develop, development practices, applying modern product management practice, you're probably not going to discover anything revolutionary new in the book. But what I love about the book is how they've clarified the vocabulary and, and distilled the ideas. And they've narrowed down the big difference between successful execution and less successful execution to four key ideas that you can see here. Um, the first one kind of obvious, focus on the really important stuff. And yes, you know, everybody knows that, but um, people are very, very rarely 
focusing directly on the really important stuff because in my experience working with large organizations, um, people think that different things are important and they don't necessarily agree on what's actually the most important thing. People have different views, different perspectives, and usually the goals and objectives are not that kind of shared. The um, other thing that they talk about, and this is the one that's really important, is figure out leading measurements and act on them. Uh, what they talk about is a book in the book is how everybody can understand a year later or or you know two years later if what we've done delivered value or not. Because usually on a longer cycle, we can measure profit, market share, we can measure um, whether we've taken customers from our competitors, whether we've increased revenue, reduced cost or something like that. But these things are not good to measure as we're executing because they work on a much longer scale. It's very, very rare that something that I do this week will massively impact my revenue. Um, and I still need to know whether what I'm doing is right or wrong. And they said that kind of really successful organizations tend to find measurements they can measure on the short scale, short term scale, that prove whether we're working towards delivering value or not, and then act on them. Then the third practice they talk about is keep a compelling scoreboard. And they have a very nice sentence in the book saying that if you're not keeping score, you're just practicing, you're not really playing. And I love it because it's very, very rare when I work as a consultant that I see people communicating really good value metrics that help people who deliver make decisions on their own. Usually, if there are value metrics, they're kind of in some PowerPoint somewhere hidden from everybody's view. And then people who need to make the decisions, people who are kind of on the edge of delivery, they don't have the context to make the right decisions. And lastly, they talk about kind of creating a cadence of accountability, making sure that this is working frequently, making sure that kind of we're really critical about what we're delivering. So basically what they talk about is that there's a gap in, in many, many, many delivery plans because high-level business goals that we can only look at after we've completed the whole thing, six months later, a year later, market share, revenue, profit, stuff like that, and kind of the deliverables, the stuff we do week to week or, or kind of day to day. And what we need to put in somewhere in between is some kind of level there of business change or customer impact. There is more shorter time scale that we can measure and figure out, are we doing the right thing? Now, the irony of the whole thing, and here's another book that you should actually kind of read, is described in Doug Hubbard's book, How to Measure Anything. Doug Hubbard's book is a phenomenal book on business metrics. And if you don't have time to read the whole book, he has a tiny article he's distilled from the book called the IT, management, IT Measurement Inversion, where he says that according to his research, um, how frequently something's measured on a software project is almost inversely proportional to how important it is. The really important stuff is very, very rarely measured and represented. The stuff that's most frequently measured is kind of pointless for value. And this is where I think, again, most organizations I've worked with as a consultant measure story points, measure function points, measure number of stories delivered, measure kind of something they're relating to complexity and effort because that's very easy to measure. That, that, that doesn't really describe that we are solving the problem in the right way. So in four disciplines of execution, they talk about what successful organizations actually measure and um, what short-term measurements they have. And they, they boil it down to two key types of measurements. The first is um, unblocking a critical blocker where, I don't know, for example, uh, Brexit happens and then there's some new legislation and if you don't have that import-export uh, kind of paperwork done in your software, people will no longer be able to use it to trade. So critical blocker, by doing this paperwork, we unblock the critical blocker, we're delivering value. Um, that type of uh, change, <clears throat> That type of value is relatively rare because it usually happens driven by external factors, by legislation, by kind of the environment. And it's very, very um, rare that somebody is completely blocked. Usually kind of we tweak and improve stuff. So the second most common type of short-term value they talk about is behavior change. 
So can we forget, forget everything else I talk about today? Uh, remember this because this really unlocks everything. Um, behavior changes in our users, in our kind of actors, uh, in, in people who we work with, in our customers. Those are the ways we can measure whether we're solving a problem, not just whether we're delivering a solution. If we help somebody complete workflow faster, if we uh, get people to buy more, if we get people to click on more links, if we get people to uh, sooner complete uh, their registration flows and things like that, we are potentially delivering value. And the nice thing about the behavior change is it can be measured on a short-term scale. We can measure it in lots of different ways. We can measure it with canary releases in production. We can measure it with test users, with data software. We can measure it with prototypes. We can, so there's lots of ways we can measure this with lots of levels of confidence, which opens up some really, really interesting possibilities. So an impact map kind of ties all of this together. And an impact map is a visualization that puts deliverables, stories, epics, tasks, whatever you need to do in the perspective of big business value through by linking it through behavior changes, by linking it through impacts. And it's basically saying, well, if we deliver better pagination, our assumption is that super fans with mobile devices will view more ads. And our assumption is that by doing that, we will grow mobile advertising. I'm not really proving that I'm growing mobile advertising immediately if I get people to view more ads. They still have to click on them. They have to kind of, we have to sell them. But this is a good leading indicator that I can measure short term. And if I deliver better pagination, people don't view more ads. This was a bad idea. Um, and an impact map is a kind of hierarchical breakdown of this stuff that allows people to visualize the big picture, allows us to prioritize entire hierarchies of uh, deliverables, allows us to understand what's being delivered, why and how to measure it, and puts that into a perspective for everybody. So um, for, for me, the big value out of visualization like this is that it's collaborative, it's visual, and it's fast. There are lots of other ways of doing the same thing, but they're usually slower. They require specific tooling. The most popular one in academia is called I-STAR, Latin letter I with an asterisk. The basic book about I-STAR is this thick. It has 700 pages. I read it because I'm interested in the topic. And um, there's like 20 types of arrows, 30 types of boxes. By the time you explain that to any business stakeholder, they've either fired you or gone to sleep. So impact maps you can you know, just use intuitively like this. And the key thing is actually you know, this level in the middle creates the connection. So um, I've been using this for more than 10 years now and helping other people use it. And one of the things that's really emerged as a theme um, over the last couple of years is that all the impact maps are very, very simple. They're not necessarily very easy. Um, there's a bunch of ways how people fail with them. Uh, there's a bunch of kind of uh, cases I've heard where uh, somebody schedules a meeting with really, really important senior stakeholders, puts them into a room with the promise that, you know, half a day later, they'll end up with alignment and just everybody fights. And um, about three years ago, my colleague Christian Hassa and I started interviewing organizations about how they're applying impact mapping, how they're facilitating it to understand what are the contexts where this is useful and how to facilitate this stuff in, in situations where it's useful. And we started distilling some interesting conclusions from the research. We've spoken to about 200 people so far. And uh, we're still working on this. Uh, the ideal outcome of this will be a book that comes out in a few years. Um, and um, what I'm going to talk about next is raw, unpolished material. That's kind of conclusions that we have so far. They, they're maybe not uh, going to stay like that when the book comes out. But the benefit of this is you get early access to this material, and maybe it will help you uh, organize impact mapping sessions and, and facilitate this easier. So by talking to people and interviewing them, we've understood that there's kind of four different contexts where impact mapping can be useful. And uh, in these four different contexts, uh, we really need different approaches to facilitating uh, uh, impact mapping sessions. So, um, the four contexts are kind of focusing a delivery where there's just too much work 
and we really need to be careful what we execute, what we deliver, what we don't deliver. Then reframing a problem when people really don't have a clear idea of the objectives they want to do, setting a vision before a big uh, initiative or kind of clarifying the vision for everybody, and also changing a business internally supported maybe by some software changes. So the first context that turns out to be really interesting is uh, focusing delivery. And the telling sign that you're in this context is that if people who deliver the solution know what the objectives are, but there's just too many objectives. So for example, we've heard from a large ERP software uh, provider where they got uh, 20 key stakeholders in a room and they gave them a task to write what they think is their key objective on a piece of paper. These 20 people wrote down 30 key objectives. This is kind of pointless. You, 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 it can't be that there's 30 key objectives to deliver. Um, uh, some other telling signs are where there's a um, kind of large piece of work with diverse goals, where there's a full backlog of epics and it's difficult to prioritize. And when there's lots and lots of related things, like you have 30 different epics that are delivering the same value and you don't know when to stop uh, in a sense. So one of the most interesting stories we've heard about this is from a large government agency where um, about a year and a half into delivery, all they've done is collect requirements and collect requirements and collect requirements. And they realized they will never get this done un unless they completely change the process. So they adopted impact mapping as well, visualizing uh, the behavior changes and, and what they need to measure short term. And it turns out the key behavior change they wanted to create is to help human caseworkers process more cases per day. So that's a number they published everywhere. And every single story, every single epic that was delivered was measured in uh, relation to that. Are they processing more cases per day or not? If yes, we've done something well. If not, it needs to be taken out. It needs to be improved. It needs to be cleaned up. And as a result, they reached full operational capacity. That's kind of the government uh, word for saying, government phrase for saying it's delivered and it's done two years earlier than anybody expected. And that's kind of largely uh, due to being able to really know when to stop and, and when uh, to continue developing stuff. So if you're in this context, here's a couple of tips that we've learned so far, what we think is a good way to facilitate this. So first of all, people have to, senior stakeholders need to have a good upfront agreement on one goal for the next milestone. And without that, it's not even worth starting up an impact mapping session. So usually I would suggest doing a half-day session before uh, the uh, impact mapping starts at all. Get the stakeholders in the room, get the goals out, get them to play politics on that level, and get them to select one goal for the next milestone. It doesn't need to be for the end of everything, just the next milestone. And that's a good input into the impact mapping session. Then a separate session bring the key delivery people, key technical people and the stakeholders into the room, get them to create the map together from the goal, figure out what the high level deliverables are, and then capture the impacts. The key thing, absolutely key thing for this type of map is to create metrics on the level of impacts and to know, for example, if your key impact for the moment is getting human case workers to process more cases per day, how much more? So we can then compare, okay, we have all these kind of tasks to do and we need to do 10% more. You know, if I have 20 epics and the first two epics get me there to 10%, the other 18 epics are just out of scope. We don't have to deliver them. We've achieved what we need to achieve. We can move on. Uh, likewise, reviewing impact metrics frequently during delivery and, and revisiting this and understanding, are we going the right direction? Are we stalling? Are we going faster than expected is really important for focusing the delivery. As a bonus tip for facilitating this kind of goal mapping session, um, I think this is a really good practice. Get the key senior stakeholders to write down what they think the next one important goal is individually and then compare it and then get them to play politics on it. Um, the other key tip uh, kind of comes directly from the four disciplines of execution book create a team scoreboard. Once you have these impact metrics, visualize them. Don't hide them. 
give them to people so they can understand where they are, how they're doing, and they can make better decisions so you are not the bottleneck. So the second context where impact mapping ends up being very useful is reframing the problem, where um, objectives are unclear or objectives are not shared. A really nice example of this is a tax authority we spoke with where they had this uh, process to, to automate. They wanted to create a machine learning fraud detection system and most of the business knowledge was held by one or two people who were their key fraud investigators that were working there for 20 years. And it was really difficult to communicate what this system actually should do. Um, other kind of contexts where this might be useful is where a project is stalled. It's been delivering for a year or two. You've delivered all the key things, but there's still a massive backlog to go through. And there's a big question like, is it worth delivering the rest or not? And what from the rest is still worth delivering? Um, and this tax authority, when kind of what, what they started doing was one person went around and spoke to lots of different stakeholders. Then they spoke to these kind of experts. And then they proposed what the system should do. They did lots of smaller impact mapping sessions. As a result of that, instead of building a artificial intelligence system that detected fraud, they realized it's a much, much better investment of time to build a system that basically eliminates cases where there's obviously no fraud so that human fraud investigators can really focus on the high value cases easily. So um, as a result, uh, they, they kind of for a six million, let's say euros invested, they, they, sa they saved more than 85 million euros. That's much, much, much more than what they expected to do. Um, so for reframing a problem, instead of organizing a big session to facilitate, it's much better to get a single person to collect all the information. Um, usually it's a bunch of smaller groups, several meetings where one facilitator, most likely that's going to be you, goes around, talks to different stakeholders, and then comes up with several proposals, usually five or six maps for people to choose from. And um, on these maps, collect only high-level deliverables. Avoid the details because you'll be able to get into the details later. The key purpose is to help people reframe the problem. So focusing on, you know, what are the potential goals, what are the potential impacts. Unlike the uh, focusing delivery context where metrics on impacts are the key, it turns out that impacts on the goal. On, on the business goal, on the milestone that we want to achieve are the really important things here because we're helping stakeholders kind of choose one of them and get their head around that. It's good to have metrics on the impacts, but it's, it's kind of really, really critical to have good metrics on the goals. So as a kind of a couple of bonus facilitation tips for this, um, lots of people told us that when they started doing an impact map, especially in this way, um, they do the business goal, then they think about, well, who are all the possible actors whose behavior we can change? Who are all the possible users, stakeholders, and just explodes. So don't do that. What I would suggest is skip the second level, go directly to the third level, come up with what are the potentially useful behavior changes, what are the potentially useful impacts, then group them into actors, and then you'll get the right groups. In fact, the uh, Swedish Interaction Design Agency that invented impact maps in use, they, uh, the current version of impact maps only has three levels. And they've merged the actor and the behavior change, the impact level, because it's kind of useful for them for UX uh, visualizations to kind of have that together. Um, I quite like having four levels. Maybe I'm a creature of habit, but I think it's useful to be able to prioritize different types of actors as well. We can say, look, this release is going to be mostly about our larger customers, or this release is mostly going to be about, be about small and medium enterprises, and then we prioritize kind of impacts for them. So it's useful to have this level as well, but skip it when you're facilitating initially focus on impacts and then group them. Um, the, the next context where impact maps can be very useful is to set a vision for a large piece of work. Uh, this is usually for like for like replacements, a legacy system being put into the cloud or rewritten in some new technology. Also, um, working with external software delivery organizations or from a software delivery organization perspective, working with external clients 
where you need to have kind of a, a, a larger scale vision for preparing a statement of work or for an RFP. And um, kind of what one really interesting story we've heard about this is there was a big earthquake and um, kind of demolished infrastructure in a city. And then uh, the city government tried to kind of organize lots of different companies to repair the city. And they were constantly running into rework where, for example, some the, the uh, water co repair company would come and they would repair the water pipes, they would pave up the streets, and then somebody would have to come and dig all that up and dig the pipes up because they had to work under them to, I don't know, install uh, uh, cables or something like that. And they had lots and lots of these things that were delaying uh, re recovery. They even had situations where several different contractors and subcontractors were given the same square to work on, and there were physical fights between the workers because they had a deadline to, to complete. And um, they kind of used impact mapping to try and figure out what would be a good way to coordinate this stuff. Originally, they were going to do some massive, massive, massive... Uh, planning tool with all sorts of complicated rule-based uh, engines. And what they ended up doing at the end was just a shared calendar because they've realized what the key behavior changes are and what they can do to support that. And they delivered 10 times earlier than expected. Um, they, this helped uh, the, the city recovery quite significantly. And I think that's, that's a massive kind of uh, win for them. So if you're in a context like this, in order to facilitate an effective impact mapping session, you need a draft of a goal. So somebody has to come up with a draft of what the vision should really be. Don't get the stakeholders in the room to argue because it's not going to go well. Um, you, kind of, you can prepare a draft to work with a single stakeholder for a draft and get people to complain about that together in a session as you're fleshing things out. I would normally, and that's what I recommended in the impact mapping book, say that Technical, key technical people and key business people need to do this together with key product people. Uh, it turns out that one of the biggest challenges for this vision setting thing is overly solutionizing it. So it's a much better thing to actually get the stakeholders to create a map on their own and not have technical people involved. The reason for this is then you can use an excuse to say we don't have any technical people in the room. Let's not talk about the solution yet. Let's focus on figuring out the problem. Then we'll get the technical people involved later. So that's kind of the, the, the important thing here. Um, for these types of maps, try to avoid listing deliverables if you can completely. So go to the goals, actors, and impacts. Work on the problem space. Once you agree with the stakeholders in the problem space, that can then turn into a vision document or an RFP. It can stay as a map or, or get translated to something else. And then the key trick is then get the senior technical people involved and give this to them as a challenge. Get, get, get them to then come up with a proposal for the deliverables to meet that challenge. And that's how we can avoid over-solutionizing things. So as a kind of a, a bonus tip for facilitating not just this, but um, other types of impact mapping sessions as well, it turns out it's really useful to create an example map from a related context. And the related is key here and show it to stakeholders at the start. This is an interesting thing because there's two ways of getting it wrong. One way of getting it wrong is to do a map that's too close to the problem. We've heard from people who've created an example impact map that is similar to the problem they're trying to map out, and then they just kill the discussion. Effectively, the result of the collaboration ends up very similar to their example because people are too much influenced by that. We've also heard from people that have created a totally different thing for a different business, for, you know, some very simple mock-up scenario. And then people, the stakeholders don't really understand the format. They can't relate to the map. So show a related thing. Now, the last context we've kind of, uh, we think is, is useful is where there's a business change that's potentially supported by software, but the software is not the primary thing. The software product is not primary. It's kind of changing the business is primary. Um, for example, one organization we, we spoke with about this, uh, they wanted to introduce an agile business analysis department in, in 
their consultancy, and they wanted to use impact maps to kind of figure out everything they need to do and coordinate that. And the key challenges in situations like this are usually identifying hidden stakeholders and identifying potential blockers, identifying uh, everybody who we need to communicate with. And that's why impact maps could be good to kind of visualize all the actors and everything. Um, so this one, I, I, I have to admit, this is the one we have the least data about. So this is the one I'm most uncertain about. It's most likely to change by the time the book comes out. But this is the data we have so far. So when uh, doing this, it turns out it's actually more useful that the business stakeholders um, that are not directly involved in the process change are not in the room when the map is being created. And the map is created by the group of people who will actually be owning the delivery. And this is useful because it, it provides more sense of ownership over the plan to people who are actually going to be impacted by it. Um, Usually the stakeholders would review this offline, comment, approve, and things like that. And this is the only type of map that actually has to contain detailed action items because it's actually visualization of a process change plan. So um, as a final bonus tip, uh, before we switch to questions, um, lots of people have kind of complained that uh, the, the format of a map hierarchical is nice to capture, you know, these four things, but not good enough to capture everything they wanted to have for the discussions. And lots of people wanted to capture things like we need to do this and be GDPR compliant, and that applies to everything. Or we need to do this, but we must not damage our relationship with big customers or, or, or something like that. And what I'd suggest is just draw a box somewhere and add all those constraints on the map so that people can understand they apply to the whole map. Maybe uh, beneath the goal, put bullet points and then do this. And... Um, uh, finally, for me, uh, an impact map is, is a conversation helper. It's a facilitation technique. And if you want to break the format to help your discussion, by all means, do that. It's not supposed to be mathematically correct. The only thing to remember, really, is that the middle part is where the magic happens. The middle part is that helps us create this kind of leading indicators from four disciplines of execution so we can then visualize this thing and, and focus on the goals and create kind of this scoreboard and a cadence of accountability. So don't skip the middle part. So that's pretty much it. Um, uh, you can find the slides on uh, Goikonet ProDel21. Uh, I write a lot about impact maps on my blog. I've been writing about it for 10 years. So you can find lots of other stuff about it on the blog. That's kind of this URL without the rest. And um, that's pretty much it. So uh, we can take some questions. Excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Goiko, um, for excellent talk there. Um, I literally have a few pages of notes myself. Um, love the tips around like reframing the problem, letting the actors emerge um, in terms of the context that you might show those example impact maps. Uh, lots, lots of pro tips there. So thank you so much. Um, so folks, just invite you to add any questions you have for Goiko into the Q&A panel. Um, we have about 15 minutes um, for questions. So um, I see a couple already, so we'll, we'll kick off. Um, first one I see from Austin. Austin, great to see you again. Um, so when trying to reframe a problem uh, and you're doing a smaller group impact maps, how much time would you need rough ballpark per impact map? Um, so I, I think this is very contextual, but roughly from what I understand, uh, the, the, the people we interviewed, it's between an hour and an afternoon. So when doing these smaller sessions, and again, the, the reason why it's so short is that you might come back to the same group a bit later to refine the map. And uh, we're kind of, uh, there's lots of smaller sessions with kind of uh, smaller groups for somebody who's going around and interviewing everybody to try and figure out what the real problem really is and, and how to reframe it. And I think the um, those sessions um, with smaller groups are initially more about you collecting the information and then uh, kind of later maybe presenting your conclusions. So it really depends how close you are to the problem or, or kind of if 
somebody just parachutes in a, in a totally new organization where they need to understand the business domain and everything, this is probably going to be slower. But if you are a product manager in the organization and you know the domain, you know the problem, you just need to talk to kind of your stakeholders, I would suggest somewhere between an hour and, and uh, one afternoon or one morning. That's great. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Kako. Thanks, Austin, for the question. Um, just another one that's come in. Um, once you come up, come up with actors, and there are many, should you dot vote to identify the most important, or what is the best approach? Um, I would normally suggest prioritizing an impact, choosing one impact to work on that you feel is the most promising to kind of move the needle the most towards the goal. And by implication there, you will prioritize the actor directly. So um, th there are uh, other ways of doing this. And I've seen people, uh, for example, prioritize actors where they say, look, you know, uh, our goal is to, um, I don't know, improve customer retention. And there's a bunch of different actors. And um, this category of actors, well, that's where most of the kind of uh, churn is. So let's focus on them first, because that you know then you can see clearly that there's kind of this area is where you could you could help the most, um, and you can do that by dot voting or you can do that by doing you know some research and then presenting uh, data and that's why I think measurements around the impacts are also very important because knowing that you know you need to move the needle by five percent or by five five hundred percent to be successful will help you kind of figure out well you know this is impossible this is a low-hanging fruit let's do this one mm, yeah absolutely i know you called out around those kind of leading measurements or leading indicators and um, as well to tie into those impacts and um, so so again thank you for that question and um, just another one that's come in would you recommend using impact maps in conjunction with okr so maybe slightly related to that kind of measurement mm. uh, topic there around goals so so um I, first of all with the caveat that i'm not an okr expert and you know what i say about okrs might be different from um you know how you use okrs um my understanding of OKRs is that they're kind of fractal measurements that if they're used correctly, they propagate all the way through the company. So you have objectives on one level, they, became, they become key results uh, there, but those become objective for the next level down, whether you go through you know, your, your uh, departments or verticals and then product lines and products and, and whatnot up to the level of teams. I've seen people do OKRs for individuals where everybody, you know, on their own at the end in order to participate in this fractal hierarchy needs to say, you know, I need to do these three things next month or something like that. So um, impact maps overlap with that on a certain level because, we, you know, if you start from the big business goals of the organization all the way down to individual tasks, individual people's tasks, there is a level there where you're dealing with the product goals and you're dealing with what you need to do to achieve those product goals. And impact maps nicely kind of um, fit into, into that part there. And um, I think the most, um, most useful way of looking at this is that with an impact map, um, the, the goal of, the, of an impact map in the middle, um, th that really should be the goal for the next product milestone. Mm. Okay. And it's not the company goal for the next 50 years. It's not your user story, what, what needs to happen with, them. you know, it's something you're going to deliver in, 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 in five days. It's something that's kind of the next product milestone. And then th these are the kind of impacts. And effectively, if you look at that overlap, and, and the, um, this, is an ob this is probably a key result for some higher level objective. Mm. But that becomes an objective on its own level, and these become the key results for that objective that then map, map later to kind of different things. Now, if you're a very large organization, you might give this to different teams, and then they become objectives for the teams. If you have a single team that delivers stuff, well, then I don't know, maybe there's not much point dividing it even, even deeper. So I think that there is a nice overlap between you know, the, the OKR fractal hierarchy on, on a level where it starts touching 
a specific product and a specific milestone of a specific product. That's great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gunker, and thanks, uh, John, for the question there. Um, just another one. Um, should you push hard to uh, to have the whole dev team in impact mapping? I, I think this is a very contextual question. You know, if your whole dev team is five thousand people, then definitely no. <laughs> If your whole dev team is two people, then definitely yes. So, you know, somewhere along that scale, the answer changes. I think it's also important to consider the contexts. I think um, in the perspective of kind of really changing the business and the dev team being the ones that are actively changing the business, I, yes. Uh, in the context of setting the vision, I think it's even better if the technical people are not there initially, because then we can, as I said, have an excuse to provide to prevent solutionizing. We can say, look, we don't have any developers in the room. Let's not talk about how we're going to do stuff. Let's just talk about what we want to achieve. We'll talk about how we want to do stuff later. Um, yeah. And kind of, you know, for, for focusing delivery, it's important to have some senior technical people there. Somebody who can say, look, this is a week of work. This is seven man millennia of work. It's never going to get done. And, um, you know, wh whether you need all the developers, probably not in, in that case. Whether the entire dev team should see this at the end, absolutely yes. Whether they need to participate in creating it, really, this is, this is context specific. Okay, yeah, no, it sounds like definitely another context one and, and, and the size of the team perhaps there um, as well. Um, Geico, just one more question. If we have time for, for one more question, um, just any tips you'd have for doing impact mapping uh, remotely? So obviously a lot of uh, teams are still in a, a remote environment at the moment. Um, any tips for, for doing that? For uh, well, experience? I think kind of uh, I, I, everything I've said, you know, applies to remote as well. I think mm. uh, shorter sessions tend to work better when you're doing stuff remotely. I kind of... Generally, um, when I'm doing workshops remotely, I, I limit it to about like two and a half hours or something like that. We usually do three times 45 minutes with breaks in between or something like that. And, and that turns out to be a, a, a kind of a, the max where people can actually pay attention, I think. Mm -hmm. So shorter sessions, I think, uh, yes, yeah, some, some visualization tool becomes really critical. It's not really important what tool you use. Really, because uh, again, the whole purpose of this is to have a good conversation. The danger with digital tools is you have an infinite canvas. And with a physically limited board, you need to kind of keep things on a relatively high level. With an infinite canvas, people can get lost in, you know, like breaking down all these things forever. And I think uh, a big facilitation, big concern for facilitation with a digital tool is to prevent people from going too far, breaking things too low. That's great. Uh, thank you. And th thanks so much. I think for there's a lot of uh, definitely a lot of pro tips there. And thanks for, everybody for the questions as well. Um, so, Goiko, just, just a quick question. Uh, where can people find out more about your, your work? So, so the, the goiko.net is probably the, the uh, best place to, to look at that. If you're interested in kind of this product I'm building at the moment, again, that's kind of narrowkit.com. It's kind of narration parakeet. That's kind of the meta metaphor because it creates narration automatically from text. And uh, uh, the other stuff about impact mapping, if people are interested in that, is have a look at impactmapping.org. There's a ton of articles there written by people for, during the last 10 years. You have like beginners articles, more advanced articles, and, and things like that. And there's lots of examples there. So impactmapping.org would be a good, um, good resource as well. Thanks very much, uh, and I, I agree fully with us, uh, Austin's comment there that impact mapping does rock. So, so thank you very much. Um, so, Geico, th thanks again for your time. Really appreciate the the great talk, and and thank listen, you. hope to hope to see you in person in Dublin at some stage in the future at one of our our future events. Um, yeah, we should do beer, beer driven development. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, the the proper the proper BDD. So, uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, Excellent. so yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, so um, so again, thank you to, to Goiko. Um, thank you to everyone again, just for choosing uh, to, to share your time with us today. Really appreciate it. Um, big thank you to Alison and the Skills Matter team as well, our partners who host us today. And huge thank you to Workday as well uh, for supporting the meetup. 
Um, check out the Workday booth um, just in the Hopin platform for information on the open product manager roles. Um, and also check out, we have a virtual beer session and still open. So if you'd like to stick around to chat about your learnings from Geico's talk, uh, we'd invite you to do that. And uh, a couple of people asked me about the 20% uh, off code for product elevation 2021. Just have it up here on the screen as well. So I um, so hope to see you there as well. And uh, listen, thanks so much again for your, for your time. Hope you enjoyed today's meetup. Um, hope everyone is, is keeping well. And uh, we'll see you again in about three weeks time for our next meetup with uh, Jared Spill. So really looking forward to that. So thanks again, folks. See you soon.